I want to talk about something that uh, really interested me more and more over the years. It um, really came out of my, my studying rhetoric and the logic of rhetoric, which is what I wrote my dissertation about and wrote my last book about. Um, but there's a lot of aspects of this rhetorical thinking that, too, I, I've never really fleshed out in a concerted way. And um, that I also feel is particularly apropos sort of to the, to the present moment, to the contemporary moment. And um, funny because I normally never think about that, right? I always, you know, I, 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 you know, I like Nietzsche's Untimely Man. I like writing sort of outside of the, the, the contemporary moment and or imagining I'm writing outside of it, just talking about big ideas. And um, you know, this time I'm leaning a little bit more into what I think is happening a little bit culturally and why I think this logic that I've thought about and wrote about um, for a long time um, is, is particularly relevant. Um, and I'll tell you the title quickly and then I'll return. So I, I'll give you the title that I gave um, to a talk on it. I, I delivered to uh, uh, Renegade University online um, last month. It was supposed to be an event here in Oakland, um, but we for obvious reasons, it became all online. Um, and the title was Making Sense with Pleasure in the Age of the Argument. Right? And I want, I want to talk about all those, all those different components, right? Making sense, pleasure in the age of the argument. That's sort of the historical component. Um, and I decided I really wanted to write, write a book because I, I love writing books. Um, and I, I learned that love writing my dissertation. You know, I, I really loved a lot about grad school. I didn't like a lot, but I, I love fundamentally. I just got to read and write all day. Um, and at some point I decided I was never going to read or write anything I didn't love. Right. I stopped, you know, I, I, I only read books I loved reading and I only wrote things I wanted to write. And the dissertation um, was just such a blast. You know, I'd written an undergraduate thesis, which was maybe 75 pages, but a dissertation, you really get to settle in there. Um, and, you know, I kind of, I'll say I, I, I didn't really follow uh, dissertation protocol, right? I didn't really do a review of the literature or anything like that. Uh, I didn't really read much secondary literature. I don't even know what that means at all. I, I read about 20 books and I had an idea and I, and I wrote them and I loved it. You know, I found that um, to me, writing, writing a book was like building my dream house while living in the house, right? So I, I could, I, you know, I might set up a beautiful, you know, living space and all of a sudden I'm like, you know, I wish this had a balcony or I wish I could go from here down to a secret basement compartment and then come back up in the attic and then have a grand sweeping view. I could do it. I could build anything I wanted, right? Um, I found it so, so decadent, so luxurious. Um, always surprised when I hear grad students say they don't like writing their dissertation. I, uh, to me, it was the best part. Um, you know, and I had a had a small, uh, you know, dissertation grant one year. I think uh, ten thousand five hundred dollars. I made it last a year and a half. I, to me, I lived like a king. I wasn't eating very much or going out, but I had nothing to do all day. You know, you know, I wasn't teaching then. I could just read and write and live inside this house I was building, um, and um, yeah, it was it was a freaking blast. And then I had a kid, and. Uh, the possibility of, of making a concerted argument, of having um, the intellectual space, but then also practically the time and energy, you know, I would say it evaporated, but evaporation seems like a, um, you know, a slower process than what happened, right? It is just eliminated, right? It's just the exhaustion and the, you know, and the angst, really. Um, really put a kibosh on my book writing. Because I used to write books all the time and just leave them on my, on my desktop. I never cared really about publishing um, until I eventually, you know, I met Doug Lane through Diet Soap and Zero Books. He later became the editor of Zero Books, and that's how that happened. But I, you know, I never sought it out. Um, although one day I'll tell you a story about sending my, uh, my dissertation off to be published. It's kind of hilarious. Um, so... I began writing essays, and I really fell in love with writing essays. I love the discretion, right? I love that there are these bound things, and I love, I love the posture of them, right? Essay comes from the French, essayer, to try, right? So an essay is not 
the planting of a flag, right, and, and a claiming of territory. It's nebulous. It's a, it's a working through. It's, a, it's an organic thing. And I, I learned so much just banging through these essays and the freedom to write about whatever I wanted, whatever was on my mind. You know, unlike the academy um, and, 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 you know, graduate school, I wrote only about things I wanted to write about, but I, I couldn't really write about tequila or death or parenting or all these other things. Um, and so I, I really fell in love with the essay form and it's fueled me for a very long time. And now recently, uh, you know, I want to write a book. I, I, I want to write a concerted argument. Um, and I want to, you know, part of that process is not just delivering the things already in my head, but the very act of writing it, of course, helps me understand it, right? And that's to me what, you know, why I love, I love writing and I love teaching is that it's not just the um, conveyance or the expression of something I already think. It is in and of itself thinking. Um, so I gave this talk at a, to Renegade University's students, you know, uh, participants, fellows, and just in the act, you know, I had this, this sort of outline, but just the act of speaking live, really, you know, I, I start forging these connections, start seeing things coming into focus. Um, and I'll say I really miss that about teaching. And I try to recreate that through these uh, videos, but, you know, um, not having that audience there, I gotta say, it's, you know, I, I don't really know who I'm speaking to now. And so it's not, I saw, I saw someone actually just post on the Twitter, a great thing about why people find uh, Zoom meetings and Zoom talks so exhausting. And she said it's because it's, it's, it's one way energy expenditure, right? One of the things that's great about a live audience is that it is, it's a feedback loop. So as you're speaking, you're getting a kind of um, energetic feedback in the form of eyes, in the form of attention. Right? Attention focus is in and of itself energetic. You know that, right? We all know this. If you're, you can tell when someone's focused on something versus just looking, right? It's pretty obvious, right? And we feel that, right? It's not just a visual thing. It's not like they're staring up for space versus focusing. There's a, there's a shift in the sort of energetic distribution of, of the room and of the space. Um, but here I am trying this. And, um, you know, it's funny, I, when I was teaching uh, back at Cal, um, you know, I would talk about all kinds of things. You know, we talk about Nietzsche, or whatever the essay, Roland Barthes, and I would find myself talking about all kinds of things. And I noticed sometimes in the student comments, they'd say, well, he, he goes on a lot of digressions. And it, it was never a digression, right? It was never a digression. It was part of the pedagogy. Um, because what interests me, and the only thing that's ever really interested me, um, is the how, not really the what. I love how, how to think about something. I love the process of thinking. I love the process of what we might call critical thinking. That is, seeing the very terms of how something is constituted and how it might be constituted otherwise. You know, I, I don't really have an agenda, right? It's not, I don't really care about the what um, as much as the how. So here I am still talking, right? I, I haven't even gotten to the preamble to, you know, making sense with pleasure in the age of the argument. I am, um, you know, I, I love these threads. I love indulging um, all the how, because um, I find them interesting. I find that that's life, you know, again, I don't have an agenda, right? And it shifts my whole relationship to my claims. And I, I, I found this out and I'm finding this out the more I try to participate, let's say, in social media, um, is that people really like to put a stake and stand behind that. Um, and the only stake I put in the ground is, is, is not really ever wanting to put a stake in the ground. Um, and that is on topic. And I will come back to that, that posture, right, and how we stand towards our claims um, in these new conditions, in what I want to call the age of the argument. So what happened is I started writing this book um, last year, last fall, and I, I took a little writing break and I, I went up to the beach and stayed to rent a cabin. It was a way I kickstart a project and I, I love having a different space in which to think, to think something new. Um, and I love being free of all the rhythms of, of the day um, around work, around my kid, and around everybody else's lives when I'm secluded. I can write whatever I want. I can get up at three in the morning, right, go back to sleep, um, right? I, I, I can make my own rhythms. 
and having my own distribution of time, I just find um, super liberating, right? And, and, and uh, the only way I really know how to um, really kickstart a project, get inside it and let it inhabit me, rather than just setting aside particular time where it might inhabit me, um, you know, because I'm busy with other things. So I started writing this thing, and then, um, you know, this, this COVID, corona thing happened, and it's, I can't talk about what I want to talk about. I can't talk about the age of the argument without talking about COVID. Um, so when I was writing this thing in, in the fall, the whole setup, the first 20 pages is about me trying to buy eggs and the decisions I have to make when I'm going to buy eggs in my local market. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I, 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 <laughs> it was great writing 20 pages about buying eggs. Um, but I'll tell you quickly, right? So I, I, it's a very precious market in San Francisco, sort of a parody, sort of the apogee, the zenith of, of, of the contemporary sort of food moment that it's most sort of, um, I don't know the word, you know, liberal moneyed. Um, so I, I, in the egg fridge, there's like, I don't know, 20 brands of eggs. And there's a chart. And on this chart, you know, there's the names of the various egg brands on one side and down the other are a whole series of, um, I guess, traits, right? All these claims to, uh, uh, to facts about these, the, about eggs. And I guess you're supposed to look for ones with all the dots. I assume I, I, so I'm looking down these categories and there's so many and they're so confusing and they seem to all be about the ethics of the chicken. Nothing really about my eggs per se, just about how somebody treated the chicken. Um, so for instance, there was one, um, are the beaks cut or not? Do I, do I, is that a good thing, a bad thing, or beaks cut? I, I, I don't, I can't even imagine how I would know whether beaks being cut were a good or bad thing for me, for the chicken, for the farmer. There are so many parties involved. Um, and, and, you know, I talk about, uh, there's, uh, there's a box category for, um, are the eggs fertile or not? I, I, I don't think I want my eggs fertile, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know how the chicken feels about that. Does it want to give up its fertile eggs? I wouldn't think so. But it looked like fertile was a good thing in the chart, but I, I don't know. And yet I buy the eggs, right? Um, and I can see, you know, um, all the different decisions that might be made as you're standing there, right? I can picture the guy who walks in and is like, you know, all this organic, all this stuff. It's all nonsense, man. You're all getting duped. You're all getting duped. I can buy a dozen eggs here for three bucks or I can buy them for 15 bucks. Of course I'm going to three bucks. The rest of you are duped. I totally get that. I totally get that, right? Because if, if you ask me what all these things mean, I have no idea. I have no idea, right? But I'm still buying the eggs that, that have a nice cool font and you know I gotta buy the eggs that um, are free range. I mean, who doesn't want everything to be free range, right? I mean, that's can't get more American than free range, organic. Talk about a vacuous term, but I guess I want organic. You know, I, it seems good for me. It seems like it, maybe it will taste better. What's my criterion for even buying the eggs, right? And wh what criteria are these that they're offering me in my decision making? It's all so confusing. And yet I make a decision. And it made me think about how we know anything, right? So it's a great, hilarious exercise. Take anything you think you know and trace back how you know it, right? What your grounds are for knowing it. Um, and 99.9% .9 of the time, it will end in somebody told you, you read it somewhere, right? Um, there's another category. There's another way we make sense I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, but, you know, the, if you interrogate any any truth claim, any knowledge claim, anything you think you believe, or anything you do believe, you don't even think you believe it. If you trace it, it will end in very strange waters, you know? I remember when I, I moved here, San Francisco, 1991, you know, I was coming from New York and Philadelphia, um, California was different, you know? Um, and a word I kept hearing about, it really was like the buzzword for me in the early 90s, um, echinacea, 
everywhere. Everyone loved echinacea. It seemed to be this plant that grew, and the, and the Native Americans used it for their medicine, and it boosts your immune, you won't get sick. And I, I don't know how much goddamn money I've spent on echinacea over the years before I realized it seemed to have zero effect on me. Zero effect. I still sometimes got sick. I, I, the echinacea do something. It, I couldn't tell. And so finally, I was like, you know what? I'm the arbiter. Me, right here. I'm the arbiter of this decision, and I'm not going to take echinacea anymore. Um, but there is a remedy that I, that I do love. Um, it's colloidal silver. And, you know, I, I came upon it because I needed an alternative to antibiotics because I was allergic to, to many of them. And um, I don't know, I, I kind of read the story and I, I like the story of colloidal silver. I like that it used to be a common remedy. I like that it is actually used uh, by hospitals, right? It's in a lot of the, the carpeting. Um, and the, the wear for butchers and hospitals because it's, it's antimicrobial. Uh, it turns out bacteria don't like silver, right? Silver screws with their metabolism or something. It just made sense to me. Um, it seemed more, uh, I liked it more than the antibiotic story, which is so negative. It's so killing. It's so pugilistic. Um, although at times I, I like that too. I just couldn't take the antibiotics. So um, I started taking colloidal silver and I discovered shit works, right? You know, I, I remember when my, my, my kid was really young and, you know, the norovirus or the, the stomach flu is really common with kids and it passes around the family. It's really the one disease that little kids get that they can pass to you. Most of those things you just don't get from them. But that bug, man, that bug really gets inside your kid and gets around the family and it is unpleasant. Something I discovered is that you think it's coming on, same food poisoning, get it early, down a, uh, an ounce of colloidal silver, shit works. Or it works for me. I'm not telling you to take colloidal silver. I'm telling you it works for me. Um, and already begin to see a logic of how decisions might be made and how we develop criteria for decision making. Um, and particularly how we make decision making without certainty, right? How do we know for sure, right? We make, we make decisions all the time. And as you interrogate them, you realize none of them are based on anything you can really call certain. Something appealed to you, some aspect that you, you were moved by a story and you're like, yeah, I, I, that, that works for me, right? I like the Native Americans or farming up this cool plant grown everywhere and you take it and it boosts your immune system so you don't get sick. So you're outside the whole language of, 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 of war and of killing bugs and um, I don't know, there's something very compelling about it, right? Of course, the shit didn't work for me, right? So the story kind of fell flat. Um, and that already we begin to see the emergence of criteria. Um, but that criteria is a strange one, right? Because it's um, it's not grounded, right? Um, think about this corona, this COVID-19, and both things, right? So you have COVID-19, the disease, and you have the coronavirus. You know, when it first, you know, shown up in the news, you know, I'm a overeduc no, overeducated, I hate that term, I'm a um, uh, thoroughly educated <laughs> Um, Jewish boy, which means I always think if I, I can read all the literature and I can solve the problem. I can see things maybe they don't. And I can put things together. And, you know, it's a little bit of, you know, Jewish male hubris. Um, I'm aware of that. Uh, but one thing became really apparent really quickly is that no, no one knows, right? I'd read this study and I'd read that study and they would say completely opposing things or, or not always mutually exclusive, but really different, really different things. And the more this thing go, goes on, the, the, the further and further we get from certainty and the more nebulous everything becomes. Um, and it's not that their arguments aren't good, right? It's, you know, I'd read a piece and it would make these claims and then someone would be like, well, you left out the, this variable, right? That everybody in China smokes or the Italians smoke or they, the Italians live you know, culturally closer together, you know, families close, there's more old people close to young people. There's always another variable. And someone would point that out and be like, oh yeah, I guess that study didn't think about that. 
But here's the thing. There's no study that's ever going to be exhaustive, right? There's no such thing. There's always another variable. That's life, right? I mean, you know, a, a pop way to think about that is, you know, uh, complexity theory, right? Which is, you know, the butterfly flaps its wings in, you know, New Zealand and it rains here. Um, to me, the more interesting thing would be it flaps its wings and I get an itch, you know, or I fall in love. It's all the same thing. And the point is there's so many factors, right? Um, so many factors and relationships between all those factors that, you know, you can never finally exhaust all the possible variables. So what an argument is, is it's the gathering of evidence, right? Um, a good argument is generally evidence-based, means I, I, I see this happening, I see this happening, I see this happening. And it, it stipulates some kind of borders, right? And says, uh, I'm not going to consider those things. And that might be because of uh, cultural uh, bias. It might be just blind spots. It never occurred to them, which is inevitable. It's going to be huge cultural blind spots. Um, some might be strategic. I'm not going to think about these things because I don't think they're relevant. Um, but an argument sort of cuts out right, a piece of the world right, and says, OK, I'm going to take this piece and this piece and that piece and that piece. And now I'm going to fold them together, almost origami-like, into a certain shape, into a certain set of relations. Right? That's, that's what an argument is. Right? An argument is the assemblage of evidence, of, of, of data, of, and that data might be um, factual. Um, it might be affective. It might be, um, but, it's, but, it's, but it's a data point. Um, and, you know, and then they're assembled in a certain set of relationships to create a kind of engine, a kind of this, therefore this, not that, so over here, right? There's a certain set of relationships between these things. And what arguments never have, by definition, is proof, right? Proof is, um, proof is the end of the argument. It's the end of the discussion. Proof is that which is just self-evident. It's just, it's there, and then there's no more talking about it. You don't need to argue if you have proof, right? Uh, argument begins where proof leaves off, right? And I steal that from a, a modern, what's called a modern rhetorician guy. I don't even know when he wrote. Chaim Perelman wrote a book called The New Rhetoric. Um, but argument is not based on proof. It's based on evidence, but it's not based on proof. Um, because there is no proof, or sometimes there is in certain situations, but those are not situations for argumentation, right? Arguments work without a ground, without proof, without fixity, without certainty, without certainty, and without the possibility of certainty. And that's important because when you're creating the argument and you know, they're making all these arguments about you know, the way corona, the, the novel coronavirus works and the way the disease COVID-19 plays out, um, you know, the, the instinct could be, let's just keep adding variables, right? And no doubt, there is a quantitative aspect to argumentation that maybe your argument becomes more compelling um, the more information you have. But that's not necessarily true. And if you think about it as the will to exhaustion, it, it, becomes, it becomes comical, it becomes absurd, right? Be precisely because it can never exhaust itself, right? It's, it's simply an impossibility, an epistemological, an ontological impossibility, right? We just don't, it's not, there'll always be another variable. There's always going to be you. There's always going to be how you felt that morning. There's always going to be the butterfly flapping its wings, right? So arguments are these little assemblages from the world. You, you take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and then you, you set up a set of relationships. You create a little engine that creates this thing called a sense, right? This little sense, and you, and, and you bring it out to the world. And some people look at that and go, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And someone's else like, oh, that doesn't make sense. And that can be for a variety of reasons. They're just not feeling, it's not resonating with them, right? Sense is elusive. And, you know, after the Enlightenment, we like to think that it's, it's all reasonable, it's all rational, it's all logical, right? But our logic is, first of all, you know, traditional logic is hierarchical and is one particular kind of logic, right? And even in the most rigorously um, deductive argumentation, there's no such thing as ever 
being purely logical, right? I mean, that's, we know that, right? I mean, it seems absurd, you know, in, in the rhetoric, Aristotle, you know, famously talks about that every argument has um, an ethos, pathos, and logos, right? So again, I taught rhetoric for many years, and um, while I didn't teach a lot of classical rhetoric per se, um, I did find this, this triumvirate very useful, because um, every argument at some point is, is this assemblage, right? So you have ethos, and that is, you know, sometimes it's the character, stature of where the argument's coming from, right? Um, you know, it, it, sometimes talk about as authority, but your authority in a given situation can be your lack of authority, right? Um, if that makes sense. So it's really every position is coming from somewhere, right? That's what's great about ethos. When you're thinking about ethos in argumentation, is that it's perspectival. It's this person, right, speaking, or this doesn't always have to be a person, but I'll keep it to people for now. This person speaking, um, and then there's the logos, right, which is really the logical reason, right? It's it's some reason it's, I guess, you should um, do this because it will make you um, uh, sleep better, right? Um, it just, again, there's a logical reason, there's a reasonable reason, it's rational, it seems um, derived from a greater truth. And then there's pathos, which is feeling, affect, emotion. And while Aristotle suggested, you know, that ethically, um, you know, it was in bad form to emphasize the pathetic aspects of an argument. The fact is every argument is emotional to a greater or lesser degree. We make decisions, we build arguments on this, uh, on this complex set of factors, right, that will never be strictly rational, right? So an argument is, again, it's assemblage, you're cutting and piecing, you're, you're making decisions, right? You're stipulating a certain field, say this is what counts, right? Um, and this is the relationship between the parts, therefore this. Um, and that this will never be grounded in certainty. It will never be, um, it, it will never have, nor will it ever seek at its best to, to be grounded. We make arguments all the time about everything without ground. We're assembling in the air as part of the air. I used to claim that uh, rhetoric was the art and the logic of making sense of a world in motion while in motion oneself. That's pretty good. I'm saying it again. Uh, rhetoric is both the art, the practice, and the logic, the theory, of making sense of a world in motion while in motion oneself. Yeah. And this, you know, rhetoric always considered time as part of its argument. Um, it's, called kairos, the propitious moment. I, I, I'm going to talk about that. Um, but that's, that's why the great philosophers of yesteryear always poo-pooed rhetoric, because it seemed transient. You couldn't commit to anything, um, right? That they always wanted a ground. And there's this will, um, culturally, it's this prejudice left over, I, I, I think, from, from the Enlightenment, of a will to a ground, to ground it and fix it and then build from there. But I want to suggest that there is no ground, and that rather than that being a problem, rather than trying to seek the ground, we need new logics, behaviors, and modes that um, account for, um, you know, free floating, being in outer space in which there, there, there is rarely any clear orientation. Um, and so I, I, I want to say, you know, that this is the logic of all knowledge, of all arguments throughout the history of existence, right? That's what we sophists have always believed, we rhetoricians, right? That we make decisions and we make arguments not on the, not on the strength of, of the ground, not with reference or uh, a connection to a proof, but precisely the opposite. We make arguments uh, without certainty ever even entering the equation, without a will to certainty, and yet we still make arguments and we still make decisions. And I want to say that we live now in an age of the argument, in which the argument is first and foremost. Um, I mean, it, 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 this is a pretty obvious claim. Some people call this, you know, the postmodern age. Um, the world has become so loaded, I'm gonna stay away from it because I don't even know how people are using that word anymore. And, come back to, to rhetoric and say, we live in the age of the argument in which there really seems like there's no 
um, we know that there's no fixed truth, right? I mean, just in my lifetime, when I was growing up, um, you know, the New York Times was called the paper of record. People read the New York Times and was like, this is, this is what's happening. Well, that's not the case anymore, right? I mean, everybody knows the New York Times is, has an ideological bent and, and an agenda, and there's media all over the place coming at us from every angle, right? There is no paper of record. There's just this radical, beautiful, insane dissemination of positions, claims, facts. And what has happened is we, 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 we live with this red herring now, right, where people talk about fake news. But that's not, that's, that's a red herring. That's not a real issue. It might be in certain contexts, in certain situations in which, you know, we all read something fake about somebody, but that's always been the case, right? I mean, Nixon was up to that rat fucking, right? That was always part of the political agenda. It gets found out and you move on. But what fake news is premised on is the idea that there's real news, right? It's still ascribing to a truth falsity distinction, right? The age of the argument does not, proffer the issue or the, or the challenge of fake news. The age of the argument puts forth to us, proffers us um, as a challenge is the existence of multiple truths, right? Often incompatible. So I come back to this corona, this COVID, do we stay locked up? Do we not? Do we, you know, people wearing masks, people not wearing masks. Um, you know, I got to be honest, I, I kind of understand almost every position here. Some I don't, some seem nutty to me, um, but I, I can see how one would get there. One could get to that position. So, so what do you do? You know, I remember in the early days of this happening, um, you know, I remember being very self-conscious that I was wearing a mask. Um, you know, a good friend of mine, he, he still needs to commute for, for work, you know, on BART. And, his story every day was people laughing at him for wearing a mask, right? And I, on the other side, you see people um, uh, screaming at people not wearing masks. And to me, I, 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 understand, I understand both sides, right? But that also means respecting other people's decisions, right? And this is what I want to get to about the ethics of decision-making and the ethics of how we stand towards our position and other people's positions when certainty will never be on the table, right? Um, so you don't want to wear a mask. That's cool. Just don't come near me, right? I, I, I keep seeing these stories on Twitter of someone's in a store and they're wearing a mask and somebody walks up behind them and they're not wearing a mask. And I saw one today and he coughs on the guy. What is that, right? How can you be so certain? How can you be so certain that this... COVID-19, this coronavirus, isn't real, that you can just cough on somebody else and potentially risk their lives. How can you be so sure? At the same time, if you want to walk down the street and you know, you're not bugging anybody else and you're not wearing a mask, how can you be so certain to yell out the window, I'm going to call the police on you? Right? Both positions seem absurd to me, you know, um, be precisely because there is no certainty. And this, this pandemic or alleged pandemic um, is really puts this in front of us so obviously, so clearly, right? So when I began writing this piece, you know, I'm talking about buying eggs, right? And the hilarity and madness of buying eggs with all these decisions and no certainty. Um, and then this thing happened and it just, it, it was like there for the taking for me. So I had to stop and watch this thing play out a little bit because it really, um, throws us back on ourselves, right? Um, and again, culturally, this has been happening across, across sort of every domain, right? When I was growing up, not only was there the New York Times in my house, or maybe it was a different newspaper in your house, but you believed it. Um, but, you know, there was network TV, I remember 60 Minutes, and they'd have a report, and everyone would be talking about it, right? Does any, 60 Minutes still exist? Um, so when I was a kid, my you go to the pediatrician, Dr. Schiffer would say something and we just believed him. I just, he made a prescription, he went out and got it. I, 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 don't, I never listen to my doctor anymore. I, I Google shit, I look around. What we consider health has now become a big, um, a, 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 a shopping mart, right? Of all these arguments, of all these arguments that are so different, right? So you have um, Chinese medicine, right? traditional Chinese medicine, which 
um, I'll tell you, I find, I find really compelling because I've had, um, I, I, I live with a, with a very uh, acute awareness of energetic, of energy, right? Of energetic flows. It's something I've been interested in and I, my whole life, right? Since I was a kid. Um, so when I learned that traditional Chinese medicine works with qi, with, with energy, I was like, yeah, 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 I get that. That's pretty good. Um, you know, there's homeopathy, which I know people, you know, poo poo. Um, but you know, I, I love its argument. It's a very compelling argument. You you're treating like with like, you know, I love this idea of, uh, infinite traces of something. I love that things just, I don't know if you know this about homeopathy, but the, you know, <laughs> I went to a homeopath, you know, I was having chronic, chronic sinus infections, um, and I could antibiotics weren't working and I, seeing an acupuncturist to a nurse, but I thought I'd try a homeopath. And um, I, uh, she was good. I mean, we talked for a long, long time. And she asked me a lot of questions. I, I mean, I, I said more to this, this woman than I ever said to a shrink or anybody. And she sort of stops and goes, all right. You have a lot of phlegm with guilt. Um, this pretty much sums up, you know, the, 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 the Jewish predicament. You have a lot of guilt with phlegm. And she prescribed gonorrhea, which they pulled from a duck. Right? I don't know what. I just love that, man. It's so hilarious and beautiful. And, um, but the, the amount of gonorrhea from said duck, you get in various degrees of infinite removal <laughs> of the amount of something. Homeopathy is, is just so, so beautifully fantastic. Um, and either it works for you or it doesn't. You know, it didn't work for me. It took my kid when he was having all these ear infections and she, she had us take homeopathic silica, boom, sinus infection, his uh, ear infection was gone, just like that, boom, overnight. Um, go figure, right? So, you know, we have homeopathy, you have traditional Chinese medicine, you have um, Western herbal medicine, you have Western medicine itself. They're all competing. They're all making arguments about what a body is, about what disease is, about, um, you know, does disease come from you? Is it external? What's the relationship between your own way of going and the disease? Um, do we all, is it always necessarily, you know, Western medicine is, is really premised on things like germs and, 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 and as a cause of disease. And sometimes I believe that and sometimes I don't. And I don't know, they're all making an argument. That's my point, right? And these arguments are elaborate and they take up various, like all arguments, they assemble various kinds of uh, facts, various kinds of bodies, and then they relate them to each other, right? So Chinese medicine takes up bodies and energy flows and these herbs and, um, you know, these, these, you know, it's a little bit closer to what, you know, Deleuze and Guattari call the body without organs. You know, they're obsessed with the organs, the Chinese, but they also, there's a lot of movement between and amongst the organs. You know, I remember first time I, I saw um, a real profound um, traditional Chinese doctor, guy with a tremendous amount of experience in um, diagnosis. God, he spent like an hour and a half with me, his pulse touching me. I really liked that. My, my Western doctor never even touched me, right? It's all a decision tree. I'm not arguing for or against anything. I'm just showing you that everything's an argument. And at the very end, he looks at me and he, he said some things that were interesting um, that seemed true about myself. And then he's, he said something in, in Chinese and I was like, what's that? He goes, oh, that's a mist over your liver. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's what I got. I got a mist over my liver. Um, everything's up for grabs. And it's not that some are true and some aren't. That's not the criteria. That's not how we make decisions, right? They're all true, right? They're all true and none are true. It, this, is, this is the key thing for me that, you know, for, I want everyone in my world to understand, right? That decision-making um, and the assessment of things in this life very rarely turn on whether they're true or not, right? That there are other criteria that I'm going to get to with which we make decisions, right? That an argument doesn't have to be true, right? It's not, it, 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 it's out of its purview to be true. What it's trying to do is make sense. To assemble all these things, not with a ground, but with a sort of form, a kind of um, moving form, 
right? It's a, it, it has a shape, but that shape is moving, right? Um, I like to think about arguments as a calculus, right? As opposed to a geometry, right? Uh, so much of traditional knowledge is premised on geometry, right? It's, it's three dimensions, right? Um, so you can, uh, you can map everything in place and, 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 and assign, it, assign it a place, assign it a locus, right, in relationship to other things, right? That's what categories of knowledge are, right? It's a hierarchy, and hierarchy is premised on geometry, right? On, on things not moving, right? But rhetoric um, is premised on, on, on four-dimensional thinking. It introduces circumstance into the equation. So when you're building an argument, you're not fixing something to a category. Right? You're not picking something up and plopping it down over here and you're, you're taking this and going, oh yeah, that's a mammal and that's an insect and that's a spider. You're creating a form that is moving, that's in shape, like a lava lamp, right? It is a certain movement. Um, and so, so much of our thinking is premised in, um, in geometry, in mapping things in space and what the age of the argument introduces to us and that we need to begin to reckon and have a vocabulary and um, a theoretical milieu, if you will, that has the temporal as constitutive of how we make sense. Right? Can you imagine making sense without recourse to circumstance? Right? It, it, it's absurd, right? Um, so what happens when we introduce, we, we exile truth? And it's not that it, there is no truth. It's just that it's rarely relevant to how we build arguments and make decisions. Um, and then we introduce uh, time, circumstance, uh, kairos, the, the movement of time, the changing of bodies and space in relationships to each other. Um, we, we come upon a different, a different epistemology, right? a different way of knowing things. Um, a different way of, of making sense personally, as a, as a person, how, how I decide to do this or that. Um, and then finally, towards a fundamentally different ethics, a different way of, um, of, of, of standing towards each other and towards our claims. Um, and I think if we begin to introduce this sort of, this logic, this logic of what I'll call rhetoric, this logic of modern rhetoric, um, I think we can yield a, a more, more productive conversations and more, I hate that word productive, more enjoyable, more enjoyable conversations, healthier, healthier, more vital conversations, and really inaugurate a, um, a new ethics.